Well, thank you very much, uh, Iphigenia, for the introduction. Uh, one correction, I'm a pensioner. I used to work at the university. And on the 40 countries, I have stopped uh, counting. Now, good evening to everybody. It's a, really a pleasure for me to, to uh, share some ideas on the theme of pros and cons of the harmonization of cooperative law. So thank you very much for the invitation to, to do that. I will not speak on the issue of the wider issue of harmonization of enterprise laws, including cooperative law, to which you alluded, Ithienia, uh, and but a little bit wider than the specific case of Greece, uh, which is a, a case uh, within a variety of similar cases to which I will come in a minute. Now, the third international forum on cooperative law organized by Youth Cooperativum Association with the invaluable support of the International Cooperative Alliance as a pre-event to the International Cooperative Alliance Congress at the end of this month of November in Seoul in South Korea, will debate cooperative law under the overall theme of the identity of cooperatives and the harmonization of cooperative laws. Now, as can be seen from the initiative to collapse the various Greek sectoral cooperative laws into one general law and many other similar initiatives, the subject of harmonization of cooperative laws is timely. Now, the objective of my brief intervention is twofold. First, I shall attempt to somewhat classify the harmonizations in the plural of, co of laws and cooperative laws in view of exploring whether and to what extent uh, we can draw arguments from those other examples for the Greek case. And then uh, secondly, I shall derive from uh, international law some arguments uh, pro, so in favor of the Greek initiative and I have to add that my pro attitude is biased as there is no um, proof, so to speak, for a causal effect of the number of sectoral laws on the success or failure of cooperatives. But there is, or there seems to be, a correlation between a low number of sectoral laws and success. So let me try to categorize. The term harmonization of cooperative laws covers a variety of harmonizations. Their pros and cons will differ and they might or might not speak to the Greek reality. Now, the first way of uh, classifying is by, by uh, looking at international cases and intranational cases. Indeed, the, in, in general, the term harmonization of laws signifies the reduction of different general national cooperative laws. And the result is an international law, be it a universal one, of which we do not have one, or a regional international one, of which we have several. The Greek case differs in a double sense from this kind of harmonization. It is not international, but intranational, and it harmonizes a multitude of sectoral cooperative laws. Now, on this last point, it differs from those intranational harmonizations which harmonize different subnational general laws. This is the case in Australia, has been the case in Australia, in Canada, and it is planned or is thought of in the United States of America and also in the Russian Federation and possibly also in Spain. Now, cases like the one in Greece are planned, and again, I use planned for all kinds of thoughts about it, initiatives, etc., in France, Japan, Kazakhstan, and a special case of intranational intra harmonization are the framework cooperative laws in South Korea. And that means to have a framework law and then special laws on sectors. Uh, an approach which might also be used in Japan and which is similar to the French, but I'm sure David will correct me 
on that. And another case uh, which belongs to this category is uh, might be the effects, the uh, recent court ruling by the Constitutional Court of India will have on the uh, various cooperative laws uh, of the federal states in India. A class of its own of intranational um, harmonization is the codification of cooperative law in Portugal. And I'm looking very much forward to the uh, presentation which Deolinda will make in uh, the usual admirable way. You could also classify by motivation for the harmonization. And basically there are two types of motivation. One is political, and the other one is economic. Political, we have two big um, cases in the, in the past. One is um, sovereign state building after the uh, Treaty of Westphalia. And the other one was state building after the end of colonialism. And, uh, and that meant to do away with the particular laws to do away, especially uh, as far as, uh, well, in, in both cases, to do away with customary law and other types of laws to replace them all with one unified law. Now, the effects uh, this has on the um, cooperative law even today can be seen, especially in the ex-colonies, Africa, South America, and Asia in part. The other motivation type for harmonization is economic. And that is the trend. The late, the most recent harmonizations are done explicitly to uh, help create uh, larger economic spaces than uh, those provided by, by national states. If we look at the harmonized, the uniform code of OHADA, if we look at the uniform, uh, not code, sorry, law, the uniform law of the East African community, Mercosur, even the EU regulation to a certain extent, and also what is uh, planned by the African Union through its uh, um, uh, model law, which is which it is uh, about to to elaborate. Another way of classifying is by mode of harmonization. Now, the term harmonization of laws or cooperative laws covers a wide range of modes, which bring laws closer to one another, lesser to a lesser or higher degree of intensity. From very intensive unification via harmonization, approximation to coordination, or suggesting just model laws, which is the case uh, of the Ley Marco um, in, in Latin America, but will be also the case, I think, for the African Union. The general use of the term harmonization is more often than not confusing, if not incorrect. And despite of that, I'm also using the term just because it is so much in, in use. Now, what are some of the cons, uh, the arguments in favor of the harmonization, which can be derived from international law? Um, first of all, inter regional international law and the case uh, we have in Europe is the EU regulation on the statute for a European uh, cooperative society, 1435, uh, the year 2003. Now, despite its limited scope and the explicit intention of the Commission of the EU, to the contrary, it has had a harmonizing effect on a number of uh, cooperative laws of the EU member states. And uh, we have a, a book, a colleague of ours and a friend of ours, Georg Miribung, who in his book, um, uh, in his latest book, has um, alluded to that, well, not alluded, he has really shown this uh, quite, um, quite uh, nicely. Now, this effect will differ according to whether the member states have uh, one general law or several sectoral laws. Now, if you look at universal uh, international law, uh, there are two instruments, the ICA statement and the ILO recommendation 103. The ICA statement is binding on the members and the members of the ICA well, because the statement is part of the bylaws of the ICA and the ICA is an association registered under Belgian law. From that, the members have a legal obligation to translate the cooperative identity, the definition, the, the values and principles into their bylaws. And where the national laws uh, allow cooperatives to be member of the ICA, it, they may not hinder them to fulfill this obligation. 
and the variety of sectoral cooperative laws bears the risk of leading to incoherent translations of the cooperative values and principles into the bylaws of the uh, cooperatives members of the ICA. Is there anything to be drawn from the recommendation one and three? Well, first of all, it the, the recommendation one and three is legally relevant, if not binding, um, as far as cooperative law is concerned. And it is binding on, on all actors. Uh, and it integrates the content of the ICA statement into the text of the recommendation, almost uh, word by, well, not word by word, but, um, well, you can say it, it basically integrates that. Uh, so for the cooperatives who are not members of the uh, ICA, the same would apply as what I just said. They would have to, under the recommendation one and three, to translate the cooperative principles into their bylaws. Other uh, paragraphs um, of the ILO recommendation one and three from which you can derive arguments to have just one law are article, uh, sorry, paragraph one, which says that the recommendation should apply to all sectors, but that's an indication only, but it can certainly be derived from paragraph seven, which uh, includes the equal treatment uh, principle. And um, from that, I think we can say, well, uh, it is somehow strange that uh, we have several cooperative laws in many countries, but we know where we have several laws on other types of enterprises. Now this uh, one law approach is uh, very much uh, suggested by the 2001 UN draft guidelines aimed at creating a favorable, develop a favorable climate for uh, the development of cooperatives and also by the very recent UN Secretary General report on cooperatives in social development um, issued in July of this year, which has two parts and one of these parts is exclusively uh, dedicated to cooperative law. Let me just add a few other arguments which I draw from the, the guidelines uh, for cooperative legislation and you can read on them uh, on page uh, 30, 59 and 60. I add, I would like to add to these uh, which I mentioned there um, that we are most certainly uh, looking towards uh, more harmonizations coming towards us. And I think a country is better prepared if it has only one general law to cope with the problems uh, this involves. And not to forget that uh, we are not dealing only nowadays with cooperatives as such, but with cooperatives which are part of uh, global value chains um, which are composed of uh, different enterprise types. And I think if you want, again, if you want to solve the problems related to that, uh, it is, might be better to have just one, um, just one general copy of law. Let me conclude. Um, there is a, a general argument which says, well, a, a one law, a general law cannot accommodate the specifics of certain sectors. Now, I think this needs to be um, checked. Um, and, and the question, of course, is do we really need several laws or can that be accommodated? If there are these specifics, can't they be accommodated through a combination, a framework law plus maybe sectoral laws? Can it maybe uh, accommodated by having a law with um, separate chapters for sectors, like the approach of the Ley Marco para las Cooperativas de América Latina? Maybe also these specifics can be uh, regulated by regulations, by government instruments, or by bylaws. So I think there is still a lot of assessment to be done before we conclude that uh, any specifics have require a specific law. And of course, I think that the instrument of constitutions, which have a harmonizing effect on the legal system as a whole, are in many countries not really exploited to the end of harmonization or not harmonization. And of course, the story doesn't end here. Once you have a general law, well, the implementation will certainly lead to diverse, to diversification again, 
unless you also address the issue of you know the institutional implementation if you maintain uh, several line ministries who feel responsible for cooperatives well this will lead again to diverse um, interpretations it will lead certainly to uh, diversity of uh, policies uh, uh, not, um, not not harmonized uh, one with the other. There is a, a general uh, feeling uh, about this issue of harmonization, which I think we should take very seriously, uh, and that is um, sometimes phrased in the you know with the with, the, with catchwords like the dictatorship of unicity versus the democracy of plurality, and I think there is something to it, but the thing. I think can be solved if we apply the legislative art of abstraction when we design a law and a cooperative law uh, in particular. So thank you very much. Thank you also to the uh, interpreters. And um, well, of course, I'm here to, to discuss and uh, first of all, to listen to the others and then maybe to discuss. Thank you.